30s. Um, you, you, you've, uh, you university degree and got a good professional uh, job in, in accounting. And um, one day you're driving home from work and uh, you go to turn the signal indicator on your car uh, and your left arm open. Um, now, if you wonder, I'm not making this up. Okay, this, is, this, is, this is a story. Uh, you let the car move on. You get home safely uh, without a signal. Uh, but of course, a quick, to, a quick trip to the doctor is in order and through the process, etc., etc., etc. You end up with a neurologist, you end up with MRIs, and you discover you're full, that you have multiple sclerosis. Did you know that was coming? And over the next number of years, you're married, a uh, couple of kids. Over the next number of years, uh, you go into a severe decline to the point where uh, you really are housebound. And uh, your husband is your chief caregiver. Uh, over the years, uh, the situation uh, stabilizes, but never gets better. Uh, you are at the point where you, you, you basically can't go to the bathroom by yourself, or take a shower or a bath by yourself, or, or cook meals for yourself. Uh, you're wheelchair bound, uh, and though there are aids, uh, you just basically can't do anything for yourself. Um, and then, when you're in your early 60s, your husband is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and is dead within six months. Now, you just imagine. Uh, you've lost so much. Uh, your children are living on another continent. They're living on another continent. They're living on another continent. Uh, they're living on another continent. And you can, cannot help yourself. You certainly cannot maintain your house. Uh, you can't feed yourself, uh, let alone do all the other things. And uh, within a couple of weeks, you've been placed in a reasonable, it's, it's, it's certainly not an awful place, but a, a, a reasonable uh, residence. Can you imagine what you would feel like? You just, just try to imagine what that would be. Imagine this one. You are, I'm just saying, shift. You are uh, in your early 80s. Uh, you have uh, uh, the beginnings, uh, perhaps that's not medically the right way to say it, the beginnings of Alzheimer's. You're, you're, you're losing some of your memory, but you still function pretty effectively most of the time. Uh, but you, don't, you won't go shopping by yourself or do anything by yourself because you may forget where you are, or where you were, or where you're going back to, or where you live and stuff. Um, and uh, one day, your, your son and your daughter pick you up uh, to go grocery shopping, or so you think. And what they do is they bring you to a residence, um, and they leave you there. This is your new one. Uh, you did not know this. And all of a sudden, uh, they've been with you for a couple of hours, and all the processing and intake has been done. And you're sitting in a room by yourself. And what you thought was that they were helping you get your groceries. And all of a sudden, here you are. And there you are. You're, you're alone. You don't know anybody there. You don't know what the routine is. Uh, it is to be hoped, of course, that some staff person comes and tells you when it's supper time and where supper is and all the rest of that. Whatever. But you're alone. Imagine how you feel. Um, the reality is, in this particular situation, that the person had been told repeatedly that they really couldn't anymore run their household, uh, and that the children were genuinely afraid um, that something was going to happen, uh, that it would be um, catastrophic in that, like a, a fire in the nose or, or something, a sort of a fall. Um, and so they had done the preparation. And indeed, this person had been to the residence. We just didn't remember it. Just didn't remember it. Imagine that um, you've spent your life with your family, and that all of a sudden you're alone. And all your frame of reference is gone. Uh, and it's not your fault. It's not because you did anything stupid or made some catastrophic mistake. Uh, it's not because you got old, because there's lots of old people that that doesn't happen to. And it's 
It's not because, because you're a victim of some grievous crime. It's because something has happened that has changed your life entirely and you have no choice. And you find yourself, you find yourself. Imagine that uh, you're, you're, you're in a residence and you've been there only a short period of time. And uh, well, I'm not going to make this like a story, I'll actually tell it as, as it is. Um, I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago uh, about uh, a visit to Shower Oil uh, that Jane and I did more after the service. Uh, it, it, it really was like uh, very, very positive, and it makes me feel really purposeful inside. Uh, but I told you how three people came up after the service, all with different things that they wanted us to take care of, and we were able to minister to these people, and it was wonderful. <coughs> Um, when I did the service uh, at Sunrise this week with uh, Alan, you know, um, I, I told you before about Alan doing services. You know, when she goes around uh, to give people their communion, the look of love in her eyes is, is, is something, it's something to be seen. Um, on this particular occasion, Alan was giving communion. I was sitting at the front at the table that I usually, uh, that I usually sit at. And uh, there's a lady right in front of me. Um, I don't know exactly how long she's been there, but not, not very long. And is finding the transition very, very difficult. And when it came time for communion, <coughs> she got all confused. Um, and uh, she had forgotten, so she said uh, later, she had forgotten what to do. Um, and Ellen was there helping her through it. And because Ellen was in front of me, I didn't see what actually happened. Um, I, I made a guess. So after communion was over, I had said to Ellen to leave uh, a, a piece of post uh, on, on, on the plate and to go get a glass of water because I thought what I had picked up was that she was having trouble swallowing. She couldn't swallow. It was enough to drive. Um, so Ellen got a glass of water and it was a piece of bread. But after the service was over, I went up to her. Because I, I don't believe I've been, I have been before. And I introduced myself and said, who well, I was an after her name, and we started to talk. Um, and I gave it to me, and now as it turned out, I needed to do that because it had, Ellen had given it to me. Um, but when she, she reached out, and her, her hand was shaking, um, she's in a difficult place uh, in, in, in her own mind. Uh, so within, I guess, about five minutes, I found out. She lived in Durban. Um, she had grown up in Verdun. Uh, I know the church, uh, the minister that uh, confirmed her. Uh, I knew him. Uh, and so we each touched base on, on, on a bunch of things. And I sort of think, you know, do you remember that reading? Do you remember the beginning of John's Gospel? Yeah. I, I, I won't I go there. Um, it's going to take me a I, I didn't bring my wrong glasses today. Where is it? Do, we do this on Christmas Eve. Remember? We don't do the Christmas story on Christmas Eve. We do this on Christmas Eve. The word was first. The word present to God. The word present to the word. A uh, God present to the word. The word was God in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing came into being without Him. What came into existence was life. And the life was the life to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness and the darkness couldn't put it out. There once was a man, his name was John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look. He came to show everyone where to look. Who to believe in? John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the life light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him, 
and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was complained, and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The Word became flesh and blood, and He moved into our neighborhood. Think about that one. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one kind glory. Like Father, like Son. Generous, inside and out. True from start to finish. There you have it. So go do it. Okay, service over, service is over, get in there. Uh, so let me ask you a question. Anybody willing? Oh, back up, I'll, I'll, I'll back up a bit. So after the service, that's on on Thursday, um, I had a conversation with the program coordinator, um, <laughs> with whom I often have problems with scheduling, but be that as a thing. I said to her, um, would it be okay uh, if, if I asked some of my people to come and visit this is, and she said, well, I'll have to get her niece's permission first. Um, and, uh, you know, okay. Um, well, they're, they sometimes are quite reasonably afraid of, of elderly being exploited, you know. And uh, they would have to meet in a mother place, couldn't meet in her room. And that's a little excessive. Usually the rule is you can be wherever, but keep the door open. That's just common sense these days. Um, so she's supposed to be contacting her, and then contacting me, and I've not heard yet. So I thought coming to St. Mary's on Sunday morning. Sort of going, um, anyone got a spare half hour? You know? And I don't know what response other ministers in this diocese would have to asking that question. I don't. It is my fondest hope that they would say, they would have to go, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, we can't schedule all in. Get you all in. But I have absolutely no doubt. That just putting that out, obviously in the context of the sermon, it's am I making a point or am I just sort of using this as a way of speaking or am I really seriously asking a question? Um, but I have absolutely no doubt that if it was required, necessary, and appropriate, and appropriate, that that woman would have a visitor from this church every day of the week. I have no doubt. So, Let's take the John reading. There's this thing about the life light. And the life light comes into the darkness. And it says all these wonderful theological things about how the darkness can't overcome it. Then it says some kind of catty things about how you know, he came into the world and we recognized him, he came to his own, his own didn't want him, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, let's let's just let's not be negative. You know, the light has come into the world. There's nothing that the world can do without that light. What that means is that there is opportunity for the light of Christ to glow and grow in the world. And indeed, lest we ever become confused about whether it is our job or not, or whether it's for the paid professional clergy. Um, or a few particular people that born the lights uh, to come with and doing a service on like Ellen or, or, or Jane or, or that. Or, or whether, whether, you know, whether, whether. Let, let's, let's not be confused. But just remember the reading that I read before from Matthew, where true religion is defined not by what you say to believe, but by how you treat other people. Originally, when I put this sermon together, I was saying, by how you act. Um, there's a danger in using that word. How you act, it can be appropriate. But acting can also be assuming a role that is not really yours. Acting can be pretending to be somebody that you're not. And when Christians become actors, do you know the original word for actor? Hippocrates from which we get hypocrite. Hypocrite, or toy, or whatever it is, I forget my Greek, uh, 
The word hypocrite literally means to be active. Uh, you can act like a Christian. You can act. And you know what? We're strong enough and bright enough and smart enough and even enough sugar to be able to maintain the pretense for a long time. That we can actually convince the people around us that we're nice. Uh, even if we need Botox to put that smile on, you know, uh, we can convince people that we're nice. And it can be an act. But you know, when the rubber hits the road, when things get tough, and when there's nothing in it for personal gain, tell you something true. You find out who the actors are. You really do. Because the actors, no matter how good they are at acting, when the rubber hits the road, whatever it can be, cliche it can be, uh, when, when, it, when it really is all about the other person and not how the spotlight shines on my greatness, you find out who's acting. You really, really do. And you really find out who's got a caring soul. And I suspect that when the person who put together the Gospel of Matthew put, put together that Gospel, uh, and, and codified it all, and finished the gospel, just about finished the gospel, and think about the sheep and the goats. What he was doing was the best he could to expose the actors and differentiate them from the genuine article. Yeah? Uh, think, think, think of the goats. Um, it doesn't say that they were evil goats, uh, just as they're goats. <laughs> Um, and goats are scavengers, right? Ooh, I don't think we would like to look at ourselves as scavengers. Scavengers of other people's emotions, of other people's experience, of other people's... We don't want to see ourselves as scavengers. Uh, we don't want to look at that as scavengers gross. Uh, goats are scavengers. And uh, Jesus is there and, and talking to these goats uh, and basically saying, he didn't do any of this, but to, to you? So clearly, what they were in for was not for the goodness, but rather to be seen or to get the prize. But then there's the others, the sheep. Uh, and, and, and the sheep are there, and they're just doing it. They're just doing it. Uh, they're not considering that this might hear me brownie points in heaven, or that maybe I'll get my name mentioned in the Chronicle, or if I do it long enough, uh, they'll name a street after me when they build up that new area in Kirkland North. Um, or you know what? It really, really, really gets good. I'm going to be like Edith Temple, who did so much work at the Veterans Hospital because she's a marginal woman. And they'll give you the order of Canada. Yeah. That's not the point of being a machine. And we know this because when it's like, uh, well, you, you, you did all this stuff and you did it for me. The sheep are getting, uh, no, uh, it was my neighbor Bob that I was doing, I didn't see you anywhere around Jesus. Um, they were doing it because it was the right thing to do. They were motivated by the right heart attitude. They weren't motivated by avoiding hell, or gaining heaven, or the esteem of the public, or the award of the Governor General. They weren't. They were motivated by the right thing was to do the right thing. And then Jesus, he doesn't say, it's as if you did it to me. He didn't say that. That's not what's in the gospel. He doesn't say, no folks, whenever you do it for each other, it's as if you were doing it for me. It says, you did it to me. You did it to me. As you care for the least of these, did it for me. Now, I don't know if the penny ever dropped for the sheep and they got it. You know, I don't hear that they went to the deal about their master's and say the theology degree. Oh, now we can understand it because we've got our degree. I don't really think it takes a degree. I don't think that's what it takes. But what's going on here is, connect John with that. The life light was coming into the world. It's God's world. Jesus is in the world already. We don't have to invoke his presence. He is already here. We don't have to pray that he will come with us when we visit a sick person or 
feeding somebody for something or whatever. He's already there. We're just catching up. That's all. The life light is in the world. And is in every person that you meet and encounter. We call the Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. Every person you meet, every person you speak to, every person you ignore, every person you cut off on the highway, breathes by the grace of the Spirit of God, the Lord, the giver of life. So when you come to represent Christ, you encounter Christ at the same time. That is heavy. It is our marching orders. We have the opportunity this week to do that with a whole lot of kids. We have an opportunity every week to do it with a whole lot of seniors. And we have an opportunity every day to represent Christ to every person we meet. In him was life, and that life is the light of the world. So now we Let's pray. God, we see the need around us, and uh, sometimes it seems to be so big that we, uh, we, we just don't know where to start. Or, sometimes we feel overwhelmed. So give us opportunity in the environments in which we find ourselves perceive you and perceive your working and perceive our calling. Give us the ability to notice someone who's lonely or someone who's hungry, whatever their hunger is. Give us the grace to just live like it's not always about me. And give us the faith to see you in every circumstance. Let your love light shine in our hearts in a way that is genuine so that we can truly, truly help people and be a source of good things. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.